Welcome to another Six Patterns video. My name is Max. I'm Kevin. And this is one of our top 25 pearls of pulmonary pathology. And uh, we've got a great case for you today. This comes from a 71-year-old male who actually has a long history of end-stage renal disease. We're not exactly sure why. But he underwent renal transplantation 10 days prior to presentation. Wow. So he was healthy and well enough to undergo renal transplantation. Before his pulmonary pre presentation. Right. Had his transplant was discharged home, and now he presents back to the emergency room after discharge, post-op day number 10, with Respir shortness of breath respiratory and failure, cough, basically, acute yeah. respiratory failure. <clears throat> of course, he has a CT scan. He has bilateral ground glass opacities that don't really show an upper or lower lobe distribution with superimposed areas of consolidation. What does that mean to you? Bilateral ground glass opacities with superimposed consolidation. So the CT will show you density in various forms. When it's really white, like bone, it's, it's dense, super dense. Consolidated. Cons consolidated. So in the parenchyma, you don't expect to see any white density. If you cannot see the lung structure through the clouds of ground glass, that density is consolidation. And it's typically a sliding scale from ground glass on the outside edges of something in the center is quite dense. It'll be called consolidation. And consolidation usually brings up infection in the eyes of the clinician. Right. So ground glass, oftentimes some um, organization, something filling the airspace, expanding the interstitium. Just not as dense. Right. So we can just look at this biopsy real quick and say, well, yeah, no duh, it's consolidated. It looks like a piece of liver. It, it, does, it looks more like liver than it does lung, with the exception of this area right here. So it makes perfect sense that this patient would be showing extensive areas of consolidation with maybe a little bit of ground glass opacities. Or macrovesicular well. steatosis. <laughs> if it was liver. Okay, exactly. Sorry. So uh, he ends up undergoing a surgical wedge biopsy, and this is what we have. So, you know, to do a surgical wedge biopsy in this setting takes a lot of fortitude because it's a huge sick. and a huge investment in the renal transplant. Oh, so, absolutely. So, what, a quarter of a million dollars? Some crazy number. $250,000, yeah. that's about right. Yeah, so we've invested all this money, done the surgery, successfully implanted the kidney, and now we're taking this patient back to surgery to get a piece of lung. Can you imagine how hard the clinicians work to make the diagnosis to explain his lung disease, right? To not do a surgical wedge biopsy. Blood cultures, bronchoscopy, lavage, maybe even transbronchial biopsies. They're gonna do anything they can not to take the patient back to surgery. And Obviously, they still had no answer. And they still had no answer. And they said, look, this patient is declining in front of our very eyes. We need our pathologist to help us. They call you in at 11 o'clock at night to do a frozen section on the lung biopsy. And here's your wedge biopsy. This isn't a frozen section, but you can play the game. Here's your wedge biopsy. And like we saw from low power, extensively consolidated. But right away, I start recognizing these polyps of organizing yep. pneumonia. Pale. Right? Pale, yep. immature, fibroblastic tissue proliferating within the airspace. Classic polyp of organizing pneumonia. And we see areas of squamous metaplasia, which you often see in the setting of acute lung injury. And moving along... And that squamous metaplasia is in the airways, right? So that's, that's all... used to be respiratory mucosa, and now it's squamous because it's been beaten up. Yep. And now we get to what oh, yeah. I can nicely highlight here. And I can go to the textbook and I can wallpaper match. And I can say, this is a hyaline membrane. Yeah. This linear strip of fibrin kind of nestled up against the markedly reactive type 2 pneumocytes. Yep. That's a hyaline membrane. Yep, they're all over. And there's quite a few of them. There's some larger balls of fibrin. But once you have hyaline membranes, you know, you're basically done, right? You have a diagnosis. What's, what's your diagnosis? Diffuse. Alveolar damage. DAD. DAD, right? So you pick up the phone. You're feeling good about yourself. You're patting yourself on the back. And you call up the clinician. And in this case, actually, it was the nephrologist who was taking care of this patient. You call up the patient and say, or the, the nephrologist, the clinician, and say, hey, I figured it out. This patient has diffuse alveolar damage. Nice. <coughs> Excuse me. Nice. 
I got choked up just, just thinking of <laughs> you doing just that. Listening about, just listening to the yeah. story. Yeah. And uh, what did the nephrologist say back? Well, that doesn't help me much because we kind of knew that he had diffuse infiltrates and he's acutely ill. So diffuse alveolar damage, diffuse acute injury. Okay, so what now? Please tell me. Help me. What is the cause? Please help me. We did the biopsy so you tell us why. And now you call me and all you've got for me is something that I knew already. Diffuse alveolar damage. So I then, don't think you're done. I don't think you're done. And that brings up the, the, the pearl that we want to share with you with this case is that your job is not through when you make a diagnosis of acute lung injury, whether that's diffuse alveolar damage, organizing pneumonia, if you care to diagnose acute and fibrinous organizing pneumonia, so-called AFOP, acute eosinophilic pneumonia, any of those patterns of acute lung injury that you see, you can't just diagnose the pattern. There's a certain set of possibilities and differential diagnoses that you need to go through <clears throat> in order to help try to identify an etiology. I think you probably have an idea of what you're going to tell them, what the plan is for approach to this situation. I do. So I came up with a mnemonic. Of course. Mnemonics are great. Mnemonics are, are, are helpful if you can remember them. Turns out this and if you can dance to them. <laughs> Turns out this mnemonic is actually not very helpful because people can't remember it. <laughs> but the, the, the yeah. mnemonic I use is C, the letter C. Yeah. If you have to explain a mnemonic, it's not very good. <laughs> yeah. The letter C, and then Deb, the person Deb, and then Fish. C, Deb, Fish. C, Deb, Fish. That's eight things that I feel, as a pulmonary pathologist, you are required to assess a biopsy for acute lung injury before you just leave it into the generic pattern diagnosis of it's just DAD, I don't know, or yeah. it's just OP, I don't know. How am I supposed to know? How am I supposed I'm to just know? a pathologist. Exactly. But with C. Deb Fish, you can do the analysis and come to a reasonable explanation to the clinician of a what reasonable things... explanation or you can say it's unlikely to be particular things right and often that is just as important as saying yep. it is something yep so see depth this number C. one c connective tissue disease what might you look for for connective tissue disease lymphoplasmacytic infiltrates in the interstitium chronic pleuritis follicular bronchiolitis these are the things you look for for yep. connective tissue yep. disease we don't really have that in this case. There's a little sprinkling of inflammation, but it's not out of proportion to the degree of acute lung injury. Right. D, drug reaction. Drug reaction. What are the classic things you look for in the setting of a drug reaction, particularly amiodarone? Cellular changes. Foamy cytoplasmic change. Macrophages, type 2 pneumocytes. Right? Yep. In the setting of acute lung injury, classic features of drug reaction. E, from Deb. Eosinophils. Right? Eosinophils associated with acute lung injury, acute eosinophilic pneumonia. Important to recognize, still has a differential diagnosis, but important to recognize because those patients respond more readily to steroids. Right. They have a chance. So DAD has got a bad prognosis, like a 55-60% mortality overall. But if you've got eosinophils with DAD, you have a better chance of getting a response to high-dose corticosteroid. Better prognosis. Okay. D-E-B. B. Blood. Right? Remember that a vasculitic process, right, pulmonary vasculitis, will have acute lung injury as part of the presentation. So if you have acute lung injury and you're seeing hemocytin-laden macrophages, or you're seeing fresh red blood cells caught up within the fibrin, and we can link our case that we, that we showed previously. We had a nice presentation on that. We had a very nice presentation. If you see that, then that acute lung injury is likely due to an acute and organizing alveolar hemorrhage process as opposed to being idiopathic. Right. So we're, Deb is fishing now. Deb is done. So now we're into fish. The, the F for fish is foreign material. Okay? Foreign material. Whether that's inhaled or aspirated foreign material right. or injected foreign material. Right. So vascular associated. Like, how about embolic? People embolize... With like chemotherapy and radiation, you can get acute, you can get DAD in that setting. Absolutely. So foreign material. So you got look around, look for foreign material, polarize the thing, make sure that they're not injecting crushed up opiates, something like that. Tablets, yeah. Uh, Deb Fish, F-I. I wish I could come up with a mnemonic that had I as the first because right. actually I... How about I see Deb Fish? Well, but then you don't have an I for fish. <laughs> well, you figure out another I. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so the eye is the most infection. Well, there, there you go. I see, I see dead fish. I see dead fish. Okay. The second eye so is now we've got a new one. Okay. <laughs> the first eye, the most important eye, is infection, right? So what features in the setting of acute lung injury are going to make you think this is an infectious process? Granulomas. Right. Necrosis. Viral cytopathic effect. And neutrophils. Now, interesting. We say those four things, but they often coexist. So uh, my point always is, if you don't see necrosis, it's unlikely you're going to make a diagnosis of infection. Right. It could be infection, but you are not going to make the diagnosis of necrosis. If you don't see the necrosis. Because necrosis is the place that it, it's screaming to you, look here for the organisms. And if do your no stains necrosis, here on this block. And look on, yeah, exactly, on that block. So the great thing about those four things is that if you have acute lung injury, I don't care what the pattern is, OP, DAD, AFOP, whatever, if you have acute lung injury and you don't have those four things, right. and the patient is not dramatically immunocompromised, right. then the likelihood of infection goes down on the differential diagnosis. You could you, say it could be infection, but nothing I yeah, see here. You can't exclude it, it. Right. but you can say, I don't see features of infection on this biopsy, right. including blah, 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 blah. So those features can be really helpful. And I find that that's the most important thing to communicate to the clinicians is you say, look, it looks like DAD. I don't see anything specific. But most importantly, I do not see histologic features that would suggest an infectious process. I would be bolder. I would say, I don't see any evidence of infection. You mm -hmm. see, now some people say, well, you, can, I mean, you can't say Yeah, you can say you that. Would be I've done it. Bold, I've you? done it at night. I've been on frozen sections. They say, we don't know what to do with this patient. I said, I, this is DAD. There's a bunch of eosinophils in here. Put them on corticosteroid tonight. Exactly. So uh, FI, so that's infection. S, S, scarring. Background scarring to suggest an underlying chronic interstitial lung disease. Like In UIP. which case, when they flare, they can present with their initial manifestation of looking like an acute lung injury, but then you look at the imaging and they have some honeycombing and the biopsy has extensive fibrosis in the background. So... Classically, acute exacerbation of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis can present with DAD or OP or a combination of the above. Yep. H. H. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis, particularly with a large exposure to organic antigen. You can get not quite hyaline membranes, but you can get prominent features of organizing pneumonia, prominent features of fibrin within the airspace. So go through, look for the alveolitis, look for the vague non-necrotizing granulomas within the interstitium. Pretty rare. Pretty rare. Because by the time you get an acute exposure... That's why I made it last. Yeah. So they already got them out of the barn when they got the barn exposure, right? Exactly. And they're not going to take them to yeah. biopsy, yeah. right? So if you get to biopsy, there is a, a situation, you know, this, um, this uh, massive inhalation of fungal spores... You know, uh, and you get a hypersensitivity, not an infection, but a hypersensitivity acute reaction to it. So, so that's your C. deb fish. And every acute lung injury case you go through, you run that differential diagnosis. And now we're going to change it to I. C. deb fish because infection is, because the is the number one critical one. thing. And then we go idiopathic. So right. if we go back, I mean, this is a perfect picture right here. Here's your hyaline membrane. Yep. Here's yep. your edema. And we go back and we think about the things we just talked about. Look at those macrophages and type 2 cells. Look at the foamy cytoplasmic cells. change of the macrophages mm -hmm. and look at the foamy cytoplasmic change of the type 2 pneumocytes. Now, some of you are looking at this picture and going, hey, 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 I, I'm worried about some of those nuclei. They look like adenovirus or something like that. They always look crazy low. They I do. Mean, these, the, In the DAD, they always look crazy. They have crazy atypia. So look for necrosis. You will not diagnose an adenovirus or other viral infection in the lung without necrosis. I promise. You know what I say, though, too, is that first, widespread viral pneumonitis is rare in today's world because most patients that have immunosuppression, they're taking um, prophylaxis against right. it, right? right? So the widespread CMV pneumonitis is rare. Right. But if you're having to struggle to identify viral Cytopathic change. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. It's probably reactive pneumocytes. Okay. So got this highly is evacuated. This evacuation is. in the setting of a, a DAD. Now I'm saying, now I'm being way more useful to my clinician. I call up and I say, this is diffuse alveolar damage. 
There's no features of infection, and I'm seeing highly vaculated pneumocytes and macrophages. Is the patient on any concerning medications such, such as amiodarone? And the clinician says, well, no, except he was on amiodarone. No, but let me look into the chart. So I actually had this conversation with the nephrologist, and we went back and looked. At the time of presentation for transplant evaluation, this patient was on amiodarone for of ASIP. Of course. Right? Yeah. And they said, we should probably stop the amiodarone because if you have a big abdominal procedure that increases your risk for amiodarone toxicity, and a renal transplant is a big abdominal procedure. Right. But there was some sort of miscommunication, and this patient was taking amiodarone at a relatively high dose the morning of the transplantation. Now, he probably didn't confess that until after the fact, because on the day of surgery, they, they would have known, like, have you been taking any medications, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, he goes back and says, well, yeah, I take my, my drug, I take it every day. I take day. my heart pill. Yeah, my heart pill every day. It's my heart pill. So uh, they stopped the amiodarone, of course. He had stopped at the time of, of transplantation. But risk factors for amiodarone, uh, duration of exposure, dose, and large trauma or, um, or, or surgery. Or and so surgery this system. patient ha had all three of those right. things, long-term, high-dose, and abdominal uh, transplantation surgery. So An interesting tidbit. The half-life of amiodarone is like four weeks. Half-life, which means amiodarone will be in this patient's system for, for like another three months. But interestingly, when you diagnose the amiodarone toxicity, and they stop the drug and they give them, they increase the dose of steroid, which is also a bad thing to do in a transplant patient, as Max knows well. Right. But you've got to do it to save him. They actually improve. So it's something about the, the injury, right, the surgery, and the drug level. So when the drug level comes down, it's like the body says, okay, I'm not going to have a hypersensitivity reaction right. anymore. We're done. We're done. We're done. So this patient did phenomenally, actually. Uh, had a Fairly rocky course, you can imagine, with lungs that look like this, but eventually discharged home, living with his, his allograft organ, dialysis free. Great, uh, great outcome in this case. Great. Fantastic, man. So, the pearl, your job is not through by recognizing acute lung injury pattern and just saying that pattern. You need to do additional work and go through your IC Deb Fish differential diagnosis. Uh, to make sure that there's no specific etiology on the pathology that can help you help your clinicians. And as with all acute injury, always do at AFB. least an AFB GMS. At least. At least on one block. Yep. Well, don't forget to like and comment below. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button if you want to be notified when new videos get uh, posted. And uh, let us know how you like it. Thanks, Max. Thanks.